Hey, Bio. Mr. Jones again. Today we got a lecture, and this is our seventh lecture so far, and we've got a um, protein lecture. So la last week we kind of did the introduction and the basics of all four biomolecules. Now we're going to talk about each one in a little more depth. And so we're going to start with proteins, and arguably, proteins are one of the most important biomolecules just because of how many functions they have in the human body and how most of living organisms really wouldn't be able to survive without them. And there's a specific kind of protein that I want to hit on a little bit at the end of the lecture, and that's this idea of enzymes. Um, and we'll get to those in, in a moment, but they're a specific kind of protein that has a very special function. So let's start us off um, with a review question. You should know the answer to this. Uh, proteins are made of what monomer? If you guessed amino acid, you were right. Keep in mind, and remember, and I did this in class a little bit, I kind of showed you guys with the dry eraser markers, the idea of monomer versus polymer. And so keep that in mind as you think about how proteins are structured. So each one of these, um, these markers is like a, is a monomer, right? And you can hook them front to back and make a long chain of them to create a big polymer. Uh, and amino acids are the monomer for protein. So each one of these would be like an amino acid, and if I hook them together, I would start to make a protein. Um, and the interesting thing that kind of continues the analogy with the dry eraser markers is the idea that each of these markers are a different color, right? You got a black one, a blue one, a green, and a, and a red. And just like the different colors of the, of the markers, amino acids are different too. They're not different colors, but they're different in terms of their structure. Um, and so you've got um, a bunch of different amino acids, each slightly different than each other. And you can almost think of it like um, an alphabet in the sense that with, you know, English language, you have 26 letters and you can arrange those letters in different orders to make different words that mean something. With proteins, you have 20 different amino acids. So not 26, but you have 20 amino acids and you can arrange those in different orders to make different proteins. Um, and so here's the basic structure of an, uh, of an amino acid. You have the amino group on one side and you've got the acid group on another. Now those are always going to be the same. Every amino acid will have that and that. The difference between the 20, what makes each one different, is this R group right there. And that is kind of like the variable, right? It does, R doesn't mean anything, it's just sort of a placeholder. It's a variable that represents the 20 different possible things that could go there, different structures that could go there. And so each one has a different R group. Um, and so here's another picture just a little bit closer. Here's the carboxyl group. On the other image it was called the acid group. Here it's called carboxyl. It's, this, just, there, it's the same group just using a different term to describe it. And so um, the carboxyl group is always going to have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, bonded over here to another oxygen. Um, and usually there'll be a hydrogen there because it's a negative charge. It'll just pick up a hydrogen. So sometimes it's written as an OH down there. And then the other side is the amino group, which has a nitrogen bonded to three hydrogens. Oops, I don't want to jump forward that fast. Uh, over at the bottom is our R group, our variable group, which would be the difference between each amino acid. And what does that mean? If you take a look at this picture, you've got a all 20. Now, I know you're going, oh no, do I have to memorize all 20 of these amino acids? No, of course not. There's no way you're gonna memorize these. The, I just wanted to show you this so you could see what the protein alphabet kind of looks like. All 20 of these are slightly different. And you're probably also now looking at these going like, well, I don't see where the amino group is and the carboxyl group and the R group. Let me show it to you on cysteine over here at the end. So what you have here is a cysteine amino acid. Here's the carboxyl group and there's the amino group. And I can always tell where the amino group is because it's where the nitrogen is sticking off. So there's a nitrogen, and then you have your carbon with your oxygens and hydrogens. And the R group is the one that's sticking off the top right there the, with the SH. And so if you look through all 20 of these, there's the R group for that one for threonine, there's the R group for serine, there's the R group for alanine, there's it for glycine, and then even down here at the bottom with arginine, there's a giant R group sticking off there. So you can kind of just get a sense for the variety of the different R groups. Some of them have like these rings sticking off the top, um, and they're all slightly different in terms of their chemical properties. And that's going to be important later. So some of these are hydrophobic, which would be these ones here. 
What does that mean? It means hydrophobic means they're repelled by water. So if you were to stick one of these things into uh, water, this R groups, these R groups that stick off the end, would actually try and get away from the water because they're hydrophobic. Some of them are acidic. You got some acidic amino acids, some basic amino acids. They're all slightly different in terms of their chemical properties, and therefore they're going to interact differently with the environment that they're in, um, and potentially with each other if they're in a chain and they're all next to each other. And that's going to come into play in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about where amino acids come from. And, you know, the original source of amino acids, um, and a human, we can make some in our body. Humans can actually make some amino acids, but plants also make amino acids, and they make them by getting into a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. So in the soil, um, plants have their roots sort of down in there, and they're ex they're in a relationship with different kinds of bacteria that's in the soil and the bacteria are able to take up nitrogen and basically, and this is this diagram is more complex than I need you to know, What all I really want you to know is that there's a relationship in soil between bacteria and plant roots that allow plants to take nitrogen from the bacteria and the bacteria have taken it from the atmosphere and that gives nitrogen to the plants so that they can make their amino acids and they make them by combining that nitrogen with simple sugars like glucose that they made during photosynthesis. Okay. And this picture up here just shows some roots. And see these little nodules? Those are um, little uh, areas where there's a lot of nitrogen fixing bacteria and giving, giving it to the plant. The plant will also give the bacteria things like glucose or, or other materials in exchange. So it's a, it's a, it's a mutualistic relationship. Um, so like I was saying before, Humans can make some of the 20 amino acids. We cannot make them all. So what does that mean for the rest of them? Well, we gotta get them in the food that we eat. Um, and so the, 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 the ones that we can't make, and there are nine of them, we call them essential because they're essential in our diet. We, basically, we have to eat them. Um, and they're over here on the side in case you were curious. You've got um, those nine. So we gotta eat foods that have them. And if you're a vegetarian, you will need to sort of uh, make sure that you're getting a variety of vegetation, a variety of plants that can give you all 20, because not all plants have all 20 in them. In fact, a lot of them don't. Um, there are some plants that do, things like soy is a very, uh, very commonly used um, food item for vegetarians because it is a complete protein. It has all 20. That's, by the way, that's what a complete protein means. It has all 20 amino acids. Um, so vegetarians might need to be a little more aware of what they're eating to get all 20 or might need to take supplements or something like that. But if you are a meat eater, then you are good to go because all animal foods are complete proteins. So anytime you eat an animal product, you're going to get all 20 amino acids in there. All right, so let's take it to the next step. So how do, what's, how do we get from these amino acids to a complete final protein in terms of its function and, ready, and it being ready to go and do its job. Um, first, we need to remember that a protein is way more complicated than just the order of its amino acids because what's going to happen is those amino acids are going to fold onto each other and, and, re, and sort of interact with each other along the chain to form a different shape depending on the order. So. First, first of all, before we get into that folding thing, it's, re it's important to remember which cell structure puts the amino acids together. You should remember this from our, when we did our cell analogy project in class. Um, so I'm gonna, actually, I'm not gonna tell you. If you, if you, if you wanna know, you can look it up, but you should remember. Um, so you got this cell structure that hooks the amino acids together in order, but that's not the end of the story because the order is one part of the structure. Um, what really matters is how that chain that we've just created folds onto itself and creates a three-dimensional shape. So in the picture below, you can see that we have an unfolded chain that was hooked up, a bunch of amino acids. Each amino acid is a slightly different color here that represents a different amino acid. And what's going to start to happen, is, and you can see in this diagram, is it's going to start to fold 
and then fold into a final shape. And then by the time it folds all the way up into this final shape, it is complete. But why does it fold? Well, it's all about those R groups I was talking about earlier. Remember how I said they all have different chemical structures? Um, or chemical properties, rather? Those properties cause the chain to fold differently. So what might happen is, let's say these, all these green ones have, are, are a certain amino acid that has an R group sticking off of it, right? That is maybe, let's say it's hydrophobic, so it doesn't want to be in water. So if this is a protein, it's going to be floating around in water because the cell's cytoplasm is mainly water. So what those green ones are going to do, because the R groups are, uh, don't want to be in water, they're going to fold to the inside and maybe that would change the shape of the protein. And so it's all about how those R groups interact, is how, what causes the protein to fold into a shape. And each protein has its unique shape. And the shape of the protein is what determines how it works and its function. Um, you can kind of break this down into sort of four steps for how proteins to get into their final structure. Step one is you have to hook up the order of the amino acids. That's the primary structure, which is just the sequence, which we can see right here. That's sort of just the sequence, the order of them. The secondary structure is when we actually start to see folding occur. So folding will start to happen along the chain, and it can happen in, in two main ways. One is sometimes a chain will sort of um, coil up like this. This is called an alpha helix. Or it might fold more like this, almost like folding back and forth, like almost like an accordion. This is called a beta sheet, or sometimes a beta pleated sheet. Um, and that's the second stage, when you start to see these little, these foldings along the chain. The third stage is when the entire chain has now folded up into a, into a final shape. And so that would be its tertiary structure. And lastly, and this isn't the case for every single protein every time, but there are some proteins that actually come together and stick to each other and, and connect to form a larger structure that is comprised of multiple proteins. That would be its fourth stage called quaternary structure. Um, and so these are the four stages. All right, last part of the lecture is just to briefly introduce enzymes, which is a specific kind of protein. And what an enzyme is, is it's a protein that speeds up a chemical reaction. This is also known as a catalyst. So the term catalyst means um, anything that speeds up or increases the rate of a reaction, a chemical reaction. And an enzyme is a biological catalyst because it's made by living things to speed up reactions inside of living things. Um, and so the reaction, the way the enzymes work is they take some substrate or a reactant and they turn it into some sort of product, whatever that might be, whatever the reaction's use is. And it's the enzymes here that are working on the reaction and help speed it up. Now, enzymes don't work all the time under every condition. So each enzyme has a very specific set of conditions that it works well in. And two examples are temperature and pH. So if you have a enzyme that works really well at, let's say you have an enzyme that's really good at digesting, let's say um, some parts of your food in your stomach. Now your stomach is an acidic environment. Its pH is around two. So an enzyme is gonna work that's designed to work in your stomach at that low pH is not going to work if I take that enzyme out and put it into a pH of 7, like a neutral pH. It's going to, what's going to happen is that the shape of the protein is going to change in the new pH, and because the shape is what determines how it works, if the shape changes, its function changes, and most likely the function is no longer going to work. So it has to be under certain conditions only. And each enzyme has its own specific conditions that it works best under. Um, and so the term for when it stops working or when it changes its shape is denaturing. So right down there, that term, denaturing, that means to an enzyme for its, uh, an enzyme changes its shape and is no longer effective. And most times it's not going to work at all, especially if it's changed a lot. So here's a picture to sort of end on, um, uh, a couple pictures to end on. One is just sort of the basic that, that reaction I said, but in in war, in a picture form. So the purple is our enzyme. The red is our substrate or reactant. 
So the red is some specific kind of uh, molecule that is going to undergo a reaction and turn into, a, into two products. So that's our product at the end. And notice how the enzyme facilitates this reaction. In order to split this red molecule into a blue and a green, two different molecules, the enzyme binds it in this area right there. Notice the shape. It's perfect for this shaped substrate. It fits right in there. This enzyme could not do a re another reaction. It could really only do this one reaction because it only can fit that one molecule and then turn it into two. So really, this enzyme has one function. And that's the way it is for any protein, really. Most proteins have um, a very specific job and function that they do because it's their shape is unique to that function. And so the shape is really determining what its job is. And in this case, the shape of this enzyme allows it to break apart this molecule and cause this reaction to go forward. Now, of course, if I introduce some heat like we see here, what's going to happen to that enzyme? Its shape is going to change. And so there's this, the, the place where the substrate fits in, that's called the active site. I don't know if you can read that word there, but I'll write it out. The active site is basically the spot where the substrate binds to the enzyme. So in this case, the substrate is this green, weird sort of shaped thing. And it's going to go in there and get broken in half. But if I add heat, the entire enzyme changes its shape. And now look at the, look at the uh, active site. It's, it's different. And it's so different to the point where this enzyme, or not enzyme, sorry, this substrate cannot fit in there. And so nothing happens. The enzyme is denatured. It's broken. It can't do its job. Game over. So it has to be under the right conditions or else it's not going to work. All right, I think that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, write them down. Come see me. But that's it for our proteins and enzymes lectures. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in class um, soon.